Hi, everybody. You've heard me maybe mention my dog, Alex. Well, this is my big dog, Alex. He's 120 pounds. He's part Pyrenees and part Labrador Retriever. He's nine years old, and he is the biggest baby on the face of the earth. He lets the cats wash his face, and he washes them, and, and he's just, he's my baby. Okay, Alex, come on. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, go on, go on, go on. All right, so uh, before we get into the psychology kind of discussion, I want to remind you all that in the uh, sometime around the middle of May, you can go to your um, election board and register to vote this fall if you're going to be 18 by the time the election comes around. So you don't have to miss it just because you won't make the deadline uh, after you turn 18 to go and register to vote. I think it's just so important. That is the number one way that you can express your views. Um, and you do it anonymously and you don't have to fight with your brother-in-law about it <laughs> or your parents about it. Um, look at the voting record of people that that you might vote for. Don't just follow the commercials. We've already talked about how we're influenced by the media, how we're influenced and manipulated uh, by groups. So uh, you know how that manipulation works. So, you know, be an informed voter. Be one of those people that has a right now to state your opinion because you went and you voted and you did your part. Okay? Mid-May. I'm a you know how I want you to vote. We won't even go into that. But just that you vote. That's the important part. Whether you vote like I do or not. That doesn't matter. Just go vote. Okay, that's the end of that commercial. All right. I kind of wonder how many of you, since we've started this chapter on psychological disorders, are starting to look at your family or your friends a little bit sideways. Okay? Uh, is it that they just have some aggravating characteristics or could they really have a disorder and if they really have a disorder you know part of that is they're not living their life well it's interfering with their ability to have a meaningful life uh, so you know if someone you know exhibits any of these traits for heaven's sakes do not go and say you know i i've taken a psychology class now and I want to tell you what's wrong with you. No, 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 no. It People only get help and only change when they realize that they have something that's making their life less valuable to them. And then it's up to them to do it. When, when you tell somebody, well, I think this is your problem, they just dig their heels in all the harder. Um, you know, our job really, when we see someone that's having difficulty, psychological difficulty, is just to be there for them, to try to still love them and support them and uh, and do what we can. And if they bring it up to encourage them to get help or maybe even at, ask if they think they might like help, not tell them that they need help. So um, just, just be a support for them during the tough times, just like you would want them to be there for you. Um, as, as we move on in this chapter, uh, as, as if anxiety and depression and bipolar wasn't serious enough in messing up people's lives, we're going to move into personality disorders. And personality disorders, oh gosh, we see everything from the people that are just frustrating or irritating to be around to those people that you really kind of need to be careful because they could have such low regard for someone else that they could even be dangerous uh, and and they can take your money and take your stuff you know they just they just don't honor your boundaries so we will talk about some of those people we will also talk about uh, in this chapter uh, people that are passive aggressive and I added that I don't think it's in your book but I think we deal with that kind of behavior frequently enough many times with our family or our significant other that it was worth looking at the symptoms of it and kind of understanding what it is and why it happens. So those are personality disorders. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, so um, we're almost to the end of the semester. You have the lecture you're going to hear now, and you have one more lecture on mental disorders. 
Then we have the unit four exam. And the unit four exam will be given just exactly like the unit three exam was. I'll put it up where you can get it off of Bob's uh, a site online. Uh, you will do the answers. You'll type them up for me. You'll send them back to me on email just like you did before. After you take that test, I will get back to you with your score on the test and your score at that point. Once you take the final exam, and you have the dates for that already, once you take the final, I turn those into the registrar's office. And you get those from the school, okay? Just like you would if you wanted to see, you know, what your GPA is or anything. You would, you would go online and, and look that up at school. So I, I will get back to you with the Unit 4 numbers. I will just post to the registrar's office your final exam. Now, your final exam won't hurt you. If you bomb it, it's like it never happened. And if you do well on it, it can help your grade. All right? If you have any questions, please email me. Uh, I try to get to those on a pretty regular basis. And uh, gosh, let's go see what those personality disorders are about. Welcome back, everybody. We are finishing up our last chapter. We've got this uh, lecture, and then we'll have one more short one after this. And we're still on anxiety disorders. We had just talked about PTSD and how, oh, terribly that can affect people, their relationships, their jobs, their ability just to function in the world. It's very, very sad. So, but let's go to one that sometimes we laugh at, and we shouldn't, but we do. And that is OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Now, about 2.3% of the people in the United States suffer from serious OCD every year. And that is, you know, it's like 6 million Americans. That's a lot of people out there worrying irrationally about the, everything coming to an end. Obsessive compulsive disorder is when anxiety triggers these intrusive, means you don't want them, they come in anyway, repetitive, you can't get them out of your head, they go round and round, and these urges to perform certain actions that seem to help reduce the anxiety. Now, if you're hooked on exercise, if you're a gym rat or a daily jogger, you understand that sometimes by the end of the day and you haven't had your exercise, you're just wound up. You just you just have to go do it. You just have to take a run. You just have to go down and do some exercise in order to calm down to reduce the anxiety. Well, people with obsessive compulsive disorder are like this all the time. And remember, we are all a little bit obsessive compulsive, but a disorder is when it interrupts your life and keeps you from having a normal life. Well, let's break it down and look at it. An obsession is the thinking part of it. That is the repeated, intrusive, uncontrollable, irrational thoughts or mental pictures. Oh, that's even better. The irrational part says generally there's no basis in reality. And many times these images people have in their head or their repetitive thoughts are ugly, nasty, sexual, violent, just disgusting to them, but they can't turn them off. Now, compulsion is the repetitive behavior that people have. These mental acts that they perform to reduce the anxiety. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. This disorder typically begins in adolescence. Sometimes it can begin in early childhood. Uh, men and women are both equally prone to this. You know, it it's, causes people to not be able to work, it causes them to mess up their relationships. When it's really to the disorder point, not just you and me doing something goofy. Now, these overt physical behaviors that people have with the compulsion, we said the compulsion part was something that you do to reduce the anxiety. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just this feeling that you can't calm down. You can't become less anxious unless you do it. It's almost like a phobia gone wild on you. 
overt physical behaviors are the ones that we see people do. And probably the most common one we think of is the hand washing over and over and over. It's like having a germ phobia only to the max. I saw a film on this one time and the woman was actually concerned for the safety of her infant because she was afraid that she would wash her infant with water that was so hot that it would harm the baby because her hands were so raw she had had to seek medical treatment because they were burned from the water and the strong soap that she had used on herself. I mean, yes, see, we're talking disorder here. We're not talking somebody with just a little bit phobic. I used to know a person that the the catchphrase in her church was, Lord have mercy, uh, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, and making the sign of the cross. And this woman did this repetitively over anything. If you said, oh, gee, I think my dog has a stomachache, it would be, oh, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And she'd be crossing herself at the speed of sound. She was a very anxious person. She definitely was OCD, among other things. She was probably borderline personality disorder. But it was something she just had to do because she got so wound up over any little thing. Covert mental behaviors are the things we do inside of our head that people don't see. Sometimes people will have a phrase that they say to themselves, okay? And for her, I'm sure she probably said, Lord, have mercy in her head constantly. But one of the things people do is counting. And I always thought that was kind of particularly strange until I was in a situation that was very, very stressful and very, very anxious. And I actually worried about my physical safety in this situation. And it lasted for quite a long time. And I found myself counting things. I would fold washcloths and count them. I couldn't put forks in the in the divider in the drawer without counting the forks. It was just making me nuts. I couldn't stop counting things. And I realized that the situation was getting better and that my counting became less till the situation was over and I stopped counting everything. And you know what? To this day, and that was 30 years ago, to this day, if I get anxious or upset about something, I will catch myself counting things. It's just what I do. But, you know, you may see people do other things, a mess with their hair, have to have everything in a particular order, have to have something that seems like a superstition, but have to have it with them in order to to feel safe. They won't fly without their lucky piece, you know, hooked to their neck or whatever it is. But we see this, but usually it's not to the disorder point. It's just to the, we, we kind of joke and laugh at them. It is a two-part disorder, obsessions and compulsions. You can have one without the other. You may have actions that you do repeatedly that you don't understand why you do them, but they seem to calm you, but without the obsessive thoughts. But for the most part, they come together. Okay, but you can have the obsessions without the compulsive behavior. You can have the compulsive behavior without the mental obsessions that are going on. Now, people around the world universally have symptoms that are specific to their culture. As an example, the germ phobia. We think of it as germs and safety and health and not catching a bug. But in a country like India, being clean Getting rid of germs, not having dirt on you, has to do with religious purity. So you see some similar behaviors, but you have different mental outlooks on it. So why do we have this going on with us? Well, you know, biology plays a big part in all of our mental health issues. And there are some factors that seem to be involved that we know about. One of those is the deficiency in norepinephrine and serotonin. And you've heard those two neurotransmitters paired together before. They are two neurotransmitters that have to do with depression. So if you have serious depression, they may give you a serotonin, an SSRI reuptake inhibitor, or they might give you a different kind of antidepressant that works both with norepinephrine and serotonin. So it's the OCD as well as, as the compulsions that you have. Sometimes they think it's just a dysfunction of the brain, something physically that your brain can't help. It's just the way it is. It's the frontal lobe, and the frontal lobe is, remember, logic and planning 
okay, where we think things through. Well, if you have something wrong with that, and this caudate nucleus regulates movement. So if the frontal lobe is thinking, and this caudate nucleus is motion, think of all the things people do. They think and they feel, they do. They think and they feel and they do. So it's it can be a learned pattern of how to deal with anxiety, but it can also be something that you just, quite frankly, can't help because in your brain, you have a dysfunction. If you have any other questions about the anxiety disorders, I would encourage you to go online and look up the DSM or go into your textbook and see what you can find or even order something up from the library. There's lots of information on obsessive compulsive disorder, and it can be very crippling for people when it comes to the disorder category. But what we're going to do right now is move away from the misery and the effects of OCD, and we're going to go to the mood disorders. And they're also called affective disorders, and that's not a typo. Affective, with an A, means emotions, your affect. If we say someone has a flat affect, that means they don't have ups and downs. Everything's just gray. Nothing's black or white or, you know, red and yellow. It's just flat. So mood disorders are persistent disorders that impair our thinking, cognition, our behavior, and our physical functioning. So it's not just what we think and do. This is going to affect us physically as well. And when we say persistent and significant, that means it's not just your regular, I'm in a bad mood this week. So let's look at major depression first. Major depression is, it is not feeling sad. I can feel sad about a lot of things, but with depression, it's much worse, much. And, you know, and it's so aggravating to you because if you suffer from major depression, people get really tired of you being depressed, of course, and they'll say, you have a great life. You know, just pull yourself out of it. Just, you know, just, you know, pull up your big girl panties and, and realize how good your life is. Okay. But it doesn't make any difference because it's something that's going on in your brain. So let's look at the symptoms here. Despondency. Despondency means I don't give a rat's rear. I'm despondent. I'm really sorry your dog died, but I can't feel anything for you. Oh, do I want to go to a concert? Nah. I know I like that band, but nah, just not going to do it. You, you just don't care about anything. You feel worthless. Worthlessness. If I died, nobody would care. I don't make any difference on this planet. I don't know why I was even born. I'm certainly not accomplishing anything. I'm never going to accomplish anything. It's just the way it is. I'm just, I'm just taking up space. Hopelessness is a sense of things will never be better. It's a terrible feeling. It's that feeling of no matter what I do or what I say or what happens, I'm going to be like this forever. Nothing's going to change. This is why people get suicidal when they have major depression. They're worthless. Life is flat. It's always going to be the same. So with this, their emotional reactions to everything are affected and including their physical functioning. You just can't function. Sometimes it's just all you can do to even crawl out of bed. So what we have with this disorder is depression, and sometimes it's tied to anxiety. Oh, what a happy mess that is. And one of the biggest risks with major depression, of course, is suicide. And if you feel suicidal or you know anyone that is suicidal or talks about suicide, please do not hesitate to try to find some kind of assistance for them, mental assistance. It's okay if you think they might be suicidal to call the police department, because if you don't do anything, it's just, it's just desperate. It's just desperate. Uh, Story time here. I had a had a young man who was my daughter's age, and they were best, best friends. And they had been best friends all through elementary school and stayed that way through adulthood. And he, the funny thing was he looked like my son, tall, lanky, red-haired. Okay, He called me mom, and he was my other kid. I knew he had kind of a rough life. He got married. He had uh, He and his wife had a child. She was a very negligent mom. He was very unhappy. And my daughter told me that, that he suffered from depression. And we talked about that. And she said, I said, you know, is he suicidal? Blah, blah, blah. 
And she said, no, he says he could never harm himself because he cannot leave his son in the hands of the mom, given the fact that she's so negligent. Well, he, they divorced and he had custody every couple of weekends, you know, of his little boy who was still in diapers, still a baby. And one weekend he picked up his son and, you know, the diapers and all that stuff. And they were going to drive down to the Lake of the Ozarks and spend the weekend with his parents at the lake. And along the way, he stopped the car, he fed his son dinner, he put him in clean jammies and diaper, he put him to sleep in the back of the car, and then he hooked up a hose to the exhaust and killed them both. He couldn't leave his son behind, so he took his son with him to death. That's a true story. So please, please, please take it very seriously if you or a friend that you have or a family member that you have that you think might be suicidal. It's it's for people that are in the in the depths of depression. Uh, there is just no hope. It's just, I might as well die. And sometimes they do. Abnormal sleep patterns. If you go to the doctor and tell him you think you might have depression, uh, one of the things they will ask you is, tell me about, are you having any problems sleeping? A lot of times what happens is you can go to bed and go to sleep, but you wake up in the early morning hours, uh, and then you can't go back to sleep, even though your body's tired. Uh, You may sleep during the day. You may sleep many hours a day uh, in order to avoid life. You may not be able to sleep at all. So sleep patterns get irregular. They'll also ask you about, have you had any significant weight gain or loss in a short period of time without planning it? Uh, So that's symptomatic problems eating. You know, everybody gets depressed. Bad things happen. But if if it lasts for over two weeks, you really need to think about getting some some help for it. And watch out for if you lose interest in the things that you've loved doing before or loved before and suddenly they just despondent, you don't care. That's very symptomatic of major depression. All right, well, let's lighten things up here a little bit. Seasonal affective disorder, SAD. SAD is something that hits some people in the winter or the autumn. It's most common in women, and it's most common within gray climates. Think Washington State, where for months and months at a time, it will be gray and rainy and no sunshine. People have this depression that comes on during this time in gray climates. And we have a tendency to stay inside more in the wintertime. And and what we really need is we need some vitamin D. We need to get outside. We need some sunshine. Quite honestly, in the wintertime, I take a vitamin D supplement because I don't drink milk. If you're a milk drinker, you're probably okay because it's fortified with vitamin D. But I don't drink milk. It doesn't work well for me. If you're not a milk person, getting that boost of vitamin D, you might try some supplements. You might try getting outside more. And some people even buy the light boxes that duplicate the, whatever it is, the frequency of light wave that's produced outside. So they, in fact, my daughter has one. I think she works on her computer all day long. She's working at home now. And so she she has her light box for part of the day because she's not getting any sunshine. It comes and it goes. And it's, but January and February, Lord, I hate January and February just in general terms. But I also watch it that I don't get depressed during that time. So while we're talking about the disorders that aren't as big and rugged as as that depression was. Uh, There's something called dysthemic disorders. Dysthemic. Dysthemic disorders is like a low-grade feeling of depression. You just don't feel good inside. Now, this is a subjective discomfort. You don't lose the ability to function. You're still going to school. You're still going to work. You're still seeing your friends sometimes. You know, you're not losing a lot of weight because you can't eat. You're not pacing all night long because you can't sleep. It's just it's just like being in a constant funk. You know, if you are coming down with something and you have just a teeny bit of temperature, you're not 98.6, you're 99.6. So it's just kind of a low-grade fever and you don't feel real good. Well, that's the way it is with dysthemic disorder. It's this low-grade feeling of depression. Well, some people have with this double depression. They run around all the time suffering from dysthemic disorder. 
Okay, they just never feel as happy, as joyful, as they don't enjoy life as much. They just have this sense of gloom and doom about the world. And then on top of that, they can fall into major depression. Well, we know that sometimes depressions are brought on by stressors in our life and situations in our life. So if you're already dealing with things not as well as you should, it's going to take less to throw you into a major depression than it is for somebody else. I think dysthemic disorder is disregarded many times as a serious disorder because you're not suicidal, you're you're still able to go to work, just come on, come on, function, function. But it it's no fun. I mean, these people don't enjoy life in the way they should enjoy life because their brain just functions in a way that keeps them from enjoying life. So this double depression can happen to them. Well, let's look a little bit here at the prevalence and the course of major depression here. It's called the common cold of psychiatric problems. It is the most common of the mental disorders, and it affects 6 to 7% of Americans annually. Do you realize that's like 20 million people? We have, what, 300 million people in the United States and six to seven percent of them are running around depressed. I mean, that's that's a lot of people. Sometimes I think we should just put Prozac in the water supply. Why is it we're like this? What is it in life? You know, is it the food coloring that we're taking in in our junk food or is it in the air or is it the stress we have in our jobs? Or maybe it's just the fact that we have more time to think thoughts about how we feel about things. You know, 100 years ago, people just were busy surviving all the time. But it is it is a serious problem in our country. Women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with chronic stress. And there's a, a couple of reasons for that. Women just have less sense of, of personal control to this, to this day. I mean, we make, what, I don't know, 75, 80 cents on the dollar to what you guys make. So our financial situation is more in jeopardy if we find ourselves alone. Let's say there is a divorce and depression follows that. Well, here's mom tr- with less money than what she had before and the responsibility of the kids all on her for the most part and less control on how she does things. Guys are just bigger and we have a male-dominated society where in many cases when it comes to safety and security, men are more able to provide for themselves than women are allowed or able to do. The other thing is women are just more likely to dwell on problems. I I like the way guys think. When I was in business, I sometimes got in trouble because I pretty much thought like a guy in business. Here's the situation. We find an answer for it. It's pure and simple. Situation, answer, situation, answer. Very analytical. And my mind does work that way a lot. If you can't fix the problem, then move on to something else. If it's beyond your control, don't worry about it. Just move on. Well, women aren't like that. For the most part, we take on not only our own problems, and our partner's problems, and our kids' problems, but our family's problems, and our friends' problems. Women are the ones that call and say, how are you doing today? You've been on my mind so much. I've been so worried for you, or I said prayers for you, or what can I do for you? We drag everybody else's problems around with us. I really think we would be better off if sometimes we handle situations like guys do. Can I fix it? Yes or no. Very linear. If I can fix it, do it. If I can't, forget it. But nope, we just chew on it like a cow chews her cud over and over and over and never forget it. I remember how it was when blah, blah, blah was so sick and died. Oh, I remember how it was when you found out that da, da, da happened. That's just 40 years ago and we're still dragging around with us. This negative thinking or worry, anxiety provoking, provoked thinking can increase these problems with depression. Left untreated, depression has a pattern typically of getting worse. And there are periods when it seems to lighten up, but the depression goes on and on and on. So if you know someone that you suspect has major depression and you've known them for a long time, 
you might think about their behaviors and see if you think they've escalated or, you know, how many times do they seem to be more normal? What triggers the anxiety that throws them into the depression? Or is it just you just don't even know why. It's just there's no reason for it that you can see. And there may very well be no reason that they can see. You know, these things are just so hard to work with because people just keep struggling and getting by as best they can. If major depression wasn't serious enough with its inability to function and its threat of suicide and its destruction of relationships, some people have bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder used to be called manic depression. We don't call it that anymore. We call it bipolar disorder. Think of the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. If we think of the North Pole, we can think of everything being exciting and wonderful and manic. And the South Pole is the worst depression you ever saw. So it's bipolar. It's this roller coaster that goes from one to the other. Well, let's look at the the symptomology of it here. Incapacitating depression. Oh, God, incapacitating. That means I just can't function. I can't make myself go to school. I can't make myself go to my job. I can't make myself fix dinner for my kids. I can't make myself, you know, I just slump around the house all day in a bathrobe and slippers wishing I could die. Incapacitating depression alternating with extreme euphoria and excitement. Okay, that's the manic part. Manic means over the top, over the top. These manic episodes just seem to come out of nowhere. There's all kinds of physical energy. A speech is rapid. Thoughts are rapid. Everybody's excited for everything going on. I mean, it would be like if I came in and I said, hey guys, guess what? Guess what? I'm going to run for office. I'm going to be the next president and I want you to be my election team. And right now we've got to get our signs made and our phone list set up in our office and let's go, let's go. Here's our hats. And you go, wow, what happened to Professor P? She has lost her mind. Well, in a way I have. I would be having a manic episode. It's a great time to get the house painted, okay? It's a a great time to, you know, reorganize the kitchen cabinets or whatever it is you do. I mean, they'll just take on all kinds of tasks, jobs, big things, and then, boom, it all goes away. Because a manic episode typically precedes a bout of major depression. And if you know yourself and you know the patterns of your moods, quite honestly, you can't even enjoy the manic stage because you know that it's going to go away. You know that you're going to feel like you want to die. You're going to know that life will have no flavor again, that there will be no energy in your life, no excitement in your life. You know, even when you're manic, that it's going to turn around and it can turn around as quickly as you wake up in the morning manic and you go to bed at night depressed, just that fast without any understanding of it. So you can see why this would be super hard to treat. If I give you a medication that calms down your mania, is it going to depress you even more? Or if I give you a medication that's going to help your depression so you don't feel so depressed, is that going to cause you to go into a manic state? How do I concoct a medication that would deal with these extremes? Because we don't know when these bouts are going to come on, do we? Sometimes people say, well, you know, she just has these spells. Well, he just has these spells. It really goes undiagnosed many times, and the family just putting it off to, well, they're just having a spell. Well, you know, she does this every once in a while. Well, he goes on a buying spree every once in a while. Well, you know, yeah, he gets in the mood to do something to the car or the house or whatever. Really goes underdiagnosed many, many times. So with these manic episodes, let's review this a little bit. You sleep very little. You have boundless energy when you're manic. You have wildly inflated ideas that I'm going to be the president thing. Grandiose. And many times it's delusional. It's just not possible. Quite honestly, I don't think any of you are going to become astronauts and be the first person to live on Mars. I just don't think it's going to happen. But if you're having delusions, you might think that you will or that the Martians are already contacting you. It's almost a little bit like a, a 
flight of delusion that's almost schizophrenic in nature. So many times these people are hospitalized. They just can't function. I mean, it's just like they're just wild. They just do weird stuff. And there are some very famous and successful people that are bipolar. So if you are bipolar, don't give up. You can you can function quite well in the world with the correct medication. And I've got a list of some people here for you. They're not on the test, but just listen to this. Kurt Cobain, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Russell Brand, that weird English comic, Robin Williams, unfortunately, was bipolar. Chris Brown, the rapper, is bipolar. Mel Gibson, Mariah Carey, Jane Pauley, the newscaster, the actress, she's older now, Sally Fields, Patty Duke, Demi Lovato, Stephen Fry, who is a, a comic, an actor, and a writer in England. You may know him if you like uh, British stuff. The late Carrie Fisher, Princess Leia. Virginia Woolf, the great author. And if you're more into classics, Gustav Mahler, the classic com composer, was bipolar long before they had any medication. These are people that are celebrity. These are people that have made it to the top and succeeded, even though they have a disorder that can be very, very crippling emotionally. Bipolar disorder. We have something that's in a way like dysthemic disorder. Okay, dysthemic disorder was that low grade depression. Cyclothemic disorder is like a low grade bipolar. You have more moderate swings of mood. It uh, has to last for two years or longer to be diagnosed, but it's severe enough to qualify as a bipolar disorder. You aren't suicidal and you don't think you're going to be living on Mars in the near future. But you just do have these odd times of extreme euphoria, energy. Oh, I think I'm, think I'm going to paint the family room. Oh, I think I'm going to, you know, tear up the lawn and do something out there. You know, just for me, those are the kinds of things I would do, I think. Or, you know, it's just the depression that's kind of like, I just feel like crap and I don't like anything or anybody. When does this occur? Usually in your early 20s. This thing of cyclothemic disorder can occur. They say the lifetime risk for it is about 1% of the population. I would probably disagree with that. I think many times it goes undiagnosed or it just gets put into the manic depressive category. I've had students many times that have come to me and said, gee, I've been diagnosed as bipolar. Do you think I'm bipolar? And I'd say, well, you know, I can't diagnose. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a therapist, but, and I can't be your therapist, but I can listen and maybe give you some hints. And basically what they usually describe to me is cyclothemic disorder but they've been lumped in with the bipolar people. So I think it's underdiagnosed. I, th I mean, I think many of us are running around with it, knowing that something's not quite right sometimes, but not knowing what it is. You know, and you can have long, long bouts of feeling perfectly normal. But if you have four or more of these episodes of extremes in any given year, that's pretty symptomatic that it is dysthemic disorder. I mean, we all have those times that we're just elated about things and excited. We all have those times where it's like, oh, this sucks so bad. It's not a consistent pattern of behavior that you have that you're just helpless to change. When we look at mood disorders, and we're on slide 27, why do we have these? Why do these extremes of euphoria and depression occur? Well, first of all, it may just be genetic. You may have inherited this. Depression in particular is very hereditary. My mom and my dad, I think, both suffered from depression. My dad more than my mom. I suffer from depression. I take medication for my depression, and I have for many, many years to keep me normal. You know, one of the big worries I used to have was, gee, if I run out of medication and can't get any more, how bad will it get? Will I get suicidal again? I can look at my family and see this. I believe that my son also has inherited this depression. In fact, he may be bipolar. And my daughter, thank God, has completely avoided it. I mean, she's just the most together person I know. It didn't hit her, but it seems to have hit my son double. So it can be very hereditable, very genetic. So look at your family and see what's going on. And also, you may just have bad chemistry. Just have bad chemistry. Your brain is not doing what it's supposed to do in the production and the use of that norepinephrine and serotonin. 
This is the depression side of it. Glutamate also is affected here. Lithium is the, the one medication that seems to help the depression and the mania to keep people more level, but there's a side effect to lithium. Some people that take it don't want to take it anymore because they feel it dulls them down. There are no highs. There are no lows. It's, it has side effects that people don't like. Okay, so you can read up on that if you want to, lithium. So what triggers these moods? Why, why can it have onset uh, in early adulthood? Well, it can be triggered by these traumatic and stressful events in your life. And when you're a little kid, you are more likely to be protected from those kinds of things and not responsible for those kinds of things. But suddenly, as a young adult, you're faced with a lot of decisions and a lot of consequences that are, that are different. And chronic stress is involved in depression. I don't know how people who have these, these high-pressure sales jobs or these high-pressure management jobs where millions of dollars are sitting in the decision that they make. That's heart attack land as far as I'm concerned. But it also triggers depression and stressful life events it can cause bipolar disorder to come on. How many people are you responsible for? How much do you have to carry on your shoulders? It's one of the reasons that you should have a way when you have a lot of stress in your life to have somebody to talk to about it or to know an activity that helps you deal with it. I used to run. I ran every night. I went to the gym almost every day. It was just me, so I wasn't, you know, not cooking dinner for somebody, but I had a high, high corporate stress job. And the only way I really dealt with it was I would run three to five miles a night and I would go to the gym every day. And I don't mean I would go off to the cute gym with the machines. I mean, I would go to an old, dirty, sweaty, mostly guys, free weight gym and I would lift. It seemed to help keep things in. I had control over something. And I'll tell you what, I was fit. It was pretty cool. People do all kinds of things to self-medicate to try to help these moods out. One of the things is smoking. Smoking. People with mental disorders are more likely to smoke. Uh, that's why a lot of times uh, that people on the street that are homeless, that you could tell there's something not quite right, they might ask you if they could buy a cigarette. People with mental disorders twice as likely to smoke. So this can also be a form of self-medication. And during that time that I was so stressed and running and weightlifting, I also smoked. So nicotine has the effect of uh, calming down your brain and changing the way neurotransmitters work. Uh, you get somebody that's a smoker and you get them stressed out, man, oh man, oh man, do they want a cigarette. Back in the days when you could smoke everywhere, I can remember when North Kansas City Hospital had uh, cigarette machines in the lobby and you could smoke in your hospital room. So smoking was, was what people did. And as a therapist, you requested people not to smoke in therapy because you didn't want them to be medicated while you were trying to deal with and see what the real symptoms were. So it, ha it can have that big an effect on somebody. Oh, give me that cigarette. Long, hard drag, clear down in the lungs. <sighs> I feel better. I don't smoke anymore. And you know, if you're already sensitive to situations, if you're already vulnerable to being upset or anxious about different things, you're just more likely to suffer from depression. It's just the way it is. Just as if you if you didn't have good balance, uh, you'd be more likely to fall down. And if you don't have good mental balance, you're more likely to, oh look, fall down. Well, now that we've been anxious and we've been depressed and we've been manic, let's look at personality disorders. Several of you have shared with me people in your life that are giving you mm, a hard time and you don't know quite how to deal with this. It seems to me that in all probability you're having to deal with people that suffer from personality disorders. Let's look at the definition of that together. Inflexible maladaptive patterns of thought, emotions, behavior, interpersonal functioning. That means functioning with other people. Interpersonal functioning across a broad range of situations. Oops, it says see your handout. You don't have the handout. Okay, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Inflexible means it doesn't change. If you have a board and it's inflexible, 
it stays the same shape, doesn't it? Rather than a willow branch that you can bend and change. Inflexible to me means, as I've seen these, that these personality disorders are never cured. They never go away. They may be lessened somewhat, but there's no medication for them. There doesn't seem to be any talk therapy that really works for them. These people are always going to have problems and they're born this way. It's just, it's like blue eyes and blonde hair. It just is what it is. And we're familiar with some of these and less familiar with others. Uh, The first one here on our slides is paranoid personality disorder. Look at this, pervasive distrust and suspiciousness and the motives of others without sufficient evidence. These are the people that think the boss is out to get them. These are the people that have conspiracy theories going on. These are the people that are jealous of you, that are suspicious of you. Where were you? Why were you talking to him? Why were you doing that? They'll look, you know, in your emails. They'll snoop in your phone. They're distrustful. Pervasive distrust. Look at that. Pervasive distrust and suspiciousness. You may have dated this person. You may have this person in your family. Oh, you might be this person. About 3% of the population, and that's a whole lot of people when you're talking 300 million people, 3% of the population, and it's generally men. It's much less likely to occur in women. So this thing of others are going to hurt you, others are going to cheat you, they, they get angry They blame others over their own shortcomings. They're jealous. So he, with the personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, distrusts where you were and what you do, and he's violent as well, and he hits you, and then says, well, if you hadn't have made me so mad, if you hadn't have done that, then I wouldn't have been jealous. So they they can be very violent, and they will turn it around that it's your fault. And if you've lived with the pattern of this for a long time, you may have learned to accept it. Most battered partners are living with someone that has paranoid personality disorder, among other things. We don't understand the cause of this. It just is. You know, they go back to the old standard. Well, childhood abuse or neglect may play a role. I'm sorry, but in psychiatry, if if we don't know why... We just look back to childhood abuse and neglect. It's just like what they paint on everything. It, it really aggravates me. I think it's just a, a basic brain chemistry situation that's going on that causes people to be paranoid because like every other mental disorder, there's a certain heritability to it. So you're familiar now with what a personality disorder is. And I gave you the example of the paranoid people. But with personality disorders, the field of mental health divides these into three different clusters. And one of the clusters doesn't seem so bad. It's the odd eccentric cluster. And it contains those people that are paranoid and those people that are schizoid. And schizoid is different than schizophrenia. It's a a detachment from relationships. Uh, People that are schizoid are very cold and flat emotionally. They're just indifferent to the opinions of others. Even if you say, oh, I just, I think your painting is just wonderful. That is just the most beautiful art I've ever seen. It's just to them because their affect is so flat. So it's, it sounds like schizophrenia, but it's not schizophrenia. Schizotypal personality disorder. This is getting closer. You're going to have people that have odd thoughts and emotional reactions to things. They may be kind of strange ways they act. Their social skills aren't very good. Their interpersonal skills aren't very good. They're usually real kind of superstitious about things, which kind of looks like the paranoia in a way, or the phobic. They're just different. They're just different. They may have a job. They probably like working by themselves the most. Uh, You know, give them the basement and the computers, and, and they're much happier. They're just kind of, well, look, odd. It says odd and eccentric cluster, and they are. They are the odd and eccentric people in our life. They're not too likely to hurt themselves. The The paranoid folks might hurt somebody else, but for the most part, they're just 
different. Then, and we're going to come back to some of these and look at them more closely. I'm just giving you the, the clusters of them right now. They're dramatic, emotional, and erratic clusters. Well, these people sound like much more fun, don't they? Okay, so you've got the antisocial personality disorder. Well, these aren't people that just don't want to go to a party. <laughs> Okay, it's not that kind of antisocial. These people are your psychopaths and your sociopaths. These are the people that either make it to the top of the corporation or to the lockdown cell in the prison. They can they can really swing to extremes. And those are the psychopaths, the antisocial people. Eh, we'll talk about them in a minute. You have your borderline personality people. Oh boy. This is the most prevalent and probably for a personal lifestyle, the most debilitating borderline personality disorder. Borderline sounds like it would be just on the edge of a personality disorder. Nope, this is full-fledged dive into the pool. Lots of symptoms we'll talk about. We won't really spend any time on hysteronic personality disorder, although it's kind of fun. These are the dramatic people, the attention-seeking people, sometimes the oversexed people, you know, the person with too big a hair, too much makeup, too much perfume, and hitting on your man, okay? Drama queens, overly dramatic expressions of emotions. They're just over the top. That's all it is. They they react emotionally over the top to everything. Oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Oh, you know, and you're like, calm down. I'm not even as upset as you are over this or hyper happy for you. The narcissists fall into this dramatic, emotional, and erratic cluster as well. Narcissistic personality disorder, and I won't go into it in big detail, but I will talk about it for a minute here. Some of the symptoms of this disorder include these grandiose ideas about who they are and what they are. They're very, very, very self-important. You know, don't you know who I am? Yeah, I know who you are and I'm not impressed, but they're impressed with themselves and they want you to be impressed with them. They will exaggerate, uh, you know, elaborate on their accomplishments, on their abilities, Oh, look, I did this. Oh, look, I did that. Well, maybe it took six people to get that done, but they take credit for the whole team. I mean, it's just they're incredibly selfish with this. And along with that, the, the thing that we usually think about with narcissists is this excessive need for admiration. You know, if you don't think the sun rises and sets out of their ears, well, you just don't appreciate them as much as you should. And they're going to boast. They're going to tell you how wonderful they are. And you're supposed to applaud and cheer and just think, as I said, the sun rises and sets right out of their ears. They can be very pretentious. Oh, look at my clothes. This suit cost, you know, $5,000. Oh, look at my Italian shoes. My shoes cost $1,000. Oh, look at my house. You know, I've got a gold toilet and gold dining room chairs. Ooh, ooh. I mean, they're they're just over the top for the sake of admiration. You just have to pay attention to them all the time. Remember, with any of these disorders, there's going to be from, from mild to excessive. And everybody has some of these symptoms. You know, when I do something really well, I want somebody to say, good job, Sherry. I mean, I like positive reinforcement, but that's entirely different than this excessive need for appreciation, this excessive need for admiration. You know, we all like an girl. We all feel antisocial sometimes. We all go over the top, you know, emotionally sometimes with the histrionic part, but it's not excessive. It does not ruin our lives and define who we are. And with personality disorders, That's typically the pattern it takes. It's not once in a while. It's not, yeah, I do that sometimes, or yeah, I think about that. No, no, no. This is life controlling for these people. And think about it. Do you want to be around these people? No. And they find themselves isolated because people are just sick and tired of how they behave. Well, then we have the anxious and fearful cluster on slide 32. These people have their own set of problems. You see the three here, uh, avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive. Avoidant people 
are very inhibited. They're very down on themselves. Usually they're just hypersensitive to any kind of criticism. If they think that you're rejecting them or disapproving of them, they'll they'll just burrow down into their hole even farther because you, you were so mean to them. While inside themselves, they feel very inadequate. And so they try to hide this inadequacy. If you criticize them at all, they just they just fall apart and back into their disorder. This is not a good personality for anyone who might want to be a writer and have their work critiqued, you know, a novelist or a history writer. This wouldn't be a good thing for someone that's in entertainment because there's always that critic with the bad review. Typically, these people stay kind of kind of away from societies. They're very inhibited with other people. It's different than just being an introvert. It has to do with an excessive an excessive and extreme social inhibition. And then the dependent personality disorder. Oh, God, I can't. Oh, I have a really hard time with these folks, okay? They're the people that are helpless. They want to be taken care of. They're very clingy. They don't want to take responsibility for anything. You know, if you say, oh, let's go out to lunch, they're like, okay, no, let's stay in. Okay, well, let's not even have lunch. Okay, they're just dependent on you to the point that it's, for me, it's just like having something attached to my leg that I have to drag around all the time, you know, a, a ball and chain, so to speak. I have, have a very hard time with this. I have a very hard time with people not taking responsibility for their own behavior, always blaming it on the situation. Oh, I didn't get my test turned in because, oh, I messed up my computer. It's my computer's fault. Well, sometimes it is the computer's fault, but sometimes you just didn't do it, right? And then there's obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Oh, wait, didn't we just talk about that back there with the anxiety disorders? Yes, but this is when it gets even worse if you think it can get even worse. So these these folks can be dangerous to themselves and dangerous to somebody else. It really, oops, here comes the kitty in the room. That's the noise you heard. So it's it's the extreme of that OCD we talked about. Okay, well, I, I told you we would talk more about antisocial personality disorders. Pervasive disregard. Pervasive means it's in everything. A pervasive rain would be it's raining everywhere. A pervasive disregard and violation of the rights of others. In other words, they just don't care if it belongs to you or it's your turn or it's you were the one that was supposed to get promoted. You were the one that worked hard to get the A. You were the one that worked hard to buy the car that they took and drove and wrecked. A pervasive disregard and violation of the rights of others. That's a really strong statement. They're called sociopaths and they're called psychopaths. Sociopaths are less severe than psychopaths. Psychopathic people are those mass killers. They're the they're really, really dangerous. They have absolutely no regard for other people at all. And they will do dangerous things to other people. Sociopaths, on the other hand, have kind of a disregard for people and their rights, but many times they become really good corporate executives. And they become corporate executives because you're just a number to them. If I have to lay off 20,000 people, well, I have to lay off 20,000 people. That's how we make a profit. Oh, I have to close that plant? Well, you know, close the plant. we got to make a profit. They're all about the company. They're all about making the money. You're just a number. You're not someone who lost your job and are never going to get it again. And I worked in corporation. I was an executive. I was not a particularly happy executive because of this attitude of the people that, that worked for us were just numbers. And that it's truly the way it was. No, it was the, probably the most miserable I ever was. Didn't fit there. But these people make up the online Romeos. Think about guys who will find vulnerable women and lie to them and con them out of money. Oh, you know, I I would come to your country, but the visa's costing me so much money. And then she sends money to help him with the visa. I know somebody that did this. Come to find out, you know, he's got six women. He's working the same way. Uh, they can be incredibly charming, quick-witted, very bright. Um, they know how to control people. They know how to work people. They're they're just they're just scary. 
I have one of these people in my family that I have to work with in a fairly regular basis because of my mother's trust. And I wouldn't trust that person with a dime. I just wouldn't. We see these behaviors in these people in childhood and early teens. These are the ones that are in trouble a lot with either the school authorities or even the law. And we don't call them antisocial personality disorder or sociopath or psychopath when they're kids. We call it conduct disorder because we don't want to scare the parents to death. Conduct, they're not acting right. It's a conduct disorder. But look out, this is this is going to get dangerous. These are the kids that, that killed the little rats or gerbils you had in elementary school. These are the kids that, you know, put the kitten in the microwave. These, these kids are capable of almost anything. It's just like there's no conscience in there, no sense or right or wrong. And the older they get, the better they get. You know, they will lie and they will manipulate and they absolutely have no anxiety about it. It's just if you're stupid enough to believe them and they can work you, well, that's the way it is. They're better than you are. It's just unbelievable to me what they do. They're almost, number three down here, contemptuous of other people's feelings and rights. They they blame the victim for their own stupidity. This this person that's in my family who will go nameless borrowed $30,000 from someone with no intention of paying her back. And then he had the gall, the absolute nerve to laugh about, laugh, literally, laugh about how stupid she was to loan him money. And she had, she had a contract. She had interest on it. He had conned her into thinking that his situation financially was temporary and was going to turn around, you know, any day, one of those things. The contract was coming through next month. And he blamed her. Well, she turned around and got a judgment against him in court. Uh, I don't know if she ever collected the money, but yeah, it was her fault for being stupid and loaning him the money. I, I can think of several things this person did, but I don't guess you want to hear all my personal horror stories. So the only hope for this is that in middle to late adulthood, sometimes these tendencies to use other people diminish. Diminish does not mean they go away. It just means they are less active in their life. You know, they're not befriending old people so that they can steal their stuff or talk them out of their stuff as much anymore. They're they're still people you can't trust. They are still people that you have to keep your guard up at all times. What if you had married this person? What if you saw this going on time after time after time where even your rights and and your belongings had no meaning to this person? Well, gosh, where's my necklace? I know I had my necklace. Oh, wait, he sold it. Well, that necklace was given to me by my grandmother. So what? That necklace was the most important thing I owned. Well, too bad. It's gone now. I mean, that's just the way they feel about things. You know, they might lie to you about it, but they also might it, say, yeah, yeah, I, I sold it. Yep. I, well, I wanted some money. I needed some money and you don't wear it very much anyway. These people are difficult to deal with in life. It's, it's really awful what they can do to other people. Well, if that wasn't bad enough to have our sociopaths stealing our stuff and lying to to us and manipulating us, then there's borderline personality disorder. Oh, boy. Ugh, borderline personality disorder. It's the most commonly recognized of the personality disorders, I think. It's about 1.5% of the population. These people don't change. Remember, they're going to be this way their whole life. It may subside a little bit, but they're always going to be kind of weird. They're very unstable in their interpersonal relationships. And I'll come back to that. Uh, They have an unstable self-image. They can be very emotional, very impulsive. Okay, so when I say instability of interpersonal relationships, big fancy words, they may be your best, 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 best friend, and they're even jealous of other friends that you have. And by next week, you're just, poop on their shoe. They either think you are the top of the heap or under the heap. They think they're wonderful or they think they're lacking. They're just all over the board. This is very serious and very disabling, and it's 
horrible to be in a relationship with this these people because they are so manipulative that pretty soon you begin to think that there's something wrong with you. They're really good at gaslighting other people. So what's going on inside their head? They have this sense of emptiness, like there's a big hole in them that never gets filled up, that they have some kind of a need that they can't, you know, an itch that they can't scratch. They have this terrible feeling of abandonment. Don't don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. There's a book about this and it's called I Hate You, Don't Leave Me because it's the way they act. They can be terribly self-destructive. They're self-destructive both in their relationships and they're self-destructive sometimes in their personal life to the point that they may burn, cut, lots of piercings sometimes, lots of weird risk-taking. They have a tendency to go out and run up their credit card bills or to take off for someplace for a weekend or I'm going to move to Denver and, you know, quit my job and do it. I mean, they're erratic. They're just, well, you know, the definition up here says impulsive, but they're very, very erratic. And so they never feel complete on the inside. They lie. They manipulate. They are who they are for whatever group they're with. An example of this is, I, well, I had a best friend for about eight years, and I knew she was, I knew she was borderline. So it kind of helped me keep track of, of not getting as manipulated by her because they have no regard for your personal boundaries none whatsoever. So, and she did commit suicide and usually they will threaten suicide and they might even do a little attempt at suicide to manipulate you or to get you to, you know, don't break up with me. I'll kill myself if you do. And unfortunately she tried that trick and he didn't get home in time to save her life and she died. So anyway, okay, she died. I'm the first person they call to tell me she's dead. Thanks a lot. Okay. A couple of months after she died on my front porch appear two of her female friends. And they're a couple, they're a lesbian couple. And I know them. And I knew she had, you know, a group of lesbian friends. And I don't think she was lesbian, but she had lesbian friends. That's cool. And so they came and they were just so sweet to me. Oh, we know how much you cared for Ruth. And oh, it's so sad, so sad. And I said, oh, come on, you know, because my husband was there and other husband. And I thought he didn't want to hear all this stuff, you know. So I so I got a bottle of white wine and some glasses and we went around on the other side of the porch and we're sitting there talking. And they said to me, How long were you and Ruth together? And I said, Excuse me? Because I know what together means. So how long were you and Ruth together? And I said, Well we were friends for about mm, eight or nine years. And they said, Well how long were you together? I said, Oh, okay. Ruth and I were never a couple. Okay, we did not have that kind of a relationship. We were very close friends. I said, I'm married. You know my husband, Bill. And they're like, yeah, 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 we know Bill. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. But how long were you and Ruth together? I said, no, really, truly, I would remember that. (laughs) And I don't know that I ever convinced them that we had not been a couple on the down low. Now, when Ruth was with her gay friends, she intimated to them that she had a female partner. She probably didn't come right out and say it, but I'm sure she talked about with Sherry and I, with Sherry and me, you know, Sherry, Sherry, Sherry. In fact, they said to me, well, she said she came to Liberty to be close to you. Well, actually, I owned the house she rented, okay, and we were friends. But they, she intimated it to them. Now, if she was with straight friends, then she would talk about her boyfriend, Jim this, Jim that, Jim the other thing. So they put on this face to whatever group they are with to fit. So you never really know if you're seeing the real person or a persona that they have built. And emotionally, they're unstable. They're hard to live with because one minute you're wonderful and the next minute you're crap. So it's interesting to read about. There's several good books on it. What causes this? Jeez, who knows? People sometimes say, well, you know, it could be sexual or emotional abuse in childhood. Well, there we go back to childhood. Your parents screwed you up, okay? Uh, A disruption in attachments in early childhood. Okay, well, if that's the case, then everybody who was ever put into foster care should be borderline personality disorder, and that's not the case. Then there's a, a biosocial development theory that says, well, part of it's biological, part of it's psychological, and part of it's environment. Well, duh. Isn't that what we say about every emotional upset? You may be biologically predisposed to it, 
psychologically you may have been conditioned to learn responses like this and the environment can affect you. I think that's true of everyone. I think I think that's kind of a cop out. As far as I can see, these folks are just born this way. We see these we see we see psychopaths and sociopaths. We see this behavior in preschoolers. I mean, that's pretty scary that you can identify oops, there's a problem here, when they're still five and six years old. Personality disorder here? Okay, they will do anything to avoid abandonment. In other words, if you are dating them, they will break up with you horribly, but don't you dare try to break up with them. If you leave me, I can't live. If you leave me, I'll hurt myself. And then, of course, a month later, they've just thrown you under the bus, so to speak. My friend, I've never seen a person who had so many police involved every time she broke up with somebody. I mean, she she would just make you think you were nuts. And many times, police would get involved. Because they had, number two here, this alternating extremes of idealization and devaluation. When I was her BFF, the sun shone out of my ears, okay? I was the most terrific friend, the most brilliant this, the most talented that. And when she decided that she wanted a new BFF, I suddenly was just worthless. Worthless. I I wasn't stable. I wasn't artistic. I wasn't capable. I wasn't a good friend. I mean, I went from being the best to the worst, and they do this with everybody. There's not much happy in between in their opinion. You're still the same person, but that's how they're acting toward you. Manipulative, ugh, your personal boundaries do not matter to them. They will criticize your parents. They will criticize your partners. They will, you know, spend your money. They will, you just, there's just no personal boundaries. They will just manipulate you into everything. Boy, if you don't know what's going on, it's very, very easy to get sucked in because usually they're very bright. They have this unstable self-image. Hmm. Let me describe my friend to you. She was about five foot ten. She had natural honey blonde hair that hung almost to her waist. She was model thin, busty, but model thin. People would see her and think that she was a professional model. Men just lined up to have any kind of attention from her. And I'm not kidding. I've seen at a party, I've seen guys just surrounding her because she was just, she was like a magnet for them. Okay, so she's hot, right? She's beautiful and she's hot and she's a doctor and she's talented and charming. And she had a bad disc in her back and she had to have back surgery. And her back surgery scar was going to be about an inch long. Because, you know, they do it all now with scopes and everything. She had an emotional meltdown. She thought that her body was going to be so gross, so deformed with this scar that no man would ever look at her again. How stupid is that? How crazy is that? You're right. Very. But it was real. It was real. Maybe a little narcissism. Maybe she wanted, you know, some special attention in there for this. But to think that you are so, you know, deformed from a one-inch scar on your back that nobody's ever going to be able to look at you again, that's that's an unstable self-image, folks. Impulsive. Oh, spending. Recreational sex. Substance abuse. Yep, yep, yep. Drugs and alcohol. Reckless driving. Binge eating. I don't know that she, I think she had an eating disorder. She was so ungodly thin. But maybe she did binge sometimes and I just didn't see it. And certainly the threats of suicide. This was a, a way to manipulate people. Self-mutilation. She had piercings in places I don't want to tell you about. Okay. And I certainly don't want them for myself. Affective. Remember, affect means emotion. She was emotionally unstable. It was almost like bipolar disorder, and it, with that idealization and devaluation, you just never knew which side of the bed she got up on. Quick to temper, quick to anger, chronic liar. I don't even know that they see it as lying. It's just they're building this different reality with each group of people that they're with. They can be very paranoid and uh, dissociative. Dissociative means that you lose touch with reality. We all dissociate, by the way. We all daydream. 
Uh, I look out sometimes to see your eyes in class, and I know you are a million miles away and have no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm sure you're dissociative while you listen to this uh, broadcast. You go off and dream somewhere. I do it too. You do it. We all do it. You know, and on our grade cards when we were in elementary school, you know, it's like, Susie doesn't pay attention. Susie's mind is somewhere else. Think about trying to live with somebody like this. I mean, put all this together into the one person. And believe me, you cannot fix them. You cannot change them. The love of a a good man or a good woman will not make a difference in their life. I know several of the guys that she dated, and they were wonderful people. And man, she turned them into just poop on her shoe by the time it was over with because it's just this roller coaster of you're the best and you're the worst. If you're dating one of these people, run. And if you wonder if you're dating one of these people, uh, there's a couple of books you can read. I Hate You, Don't Leave Me. And the other one is Walking on Eggshells. And these are old. You can buy them in paperback, probably on Amazon for a buck or two. And I think some of them have books that have followed up with them. Uh, They're written for your reading uh, level. They're not written for the professional. And they're written from first person. This is what it's like to live with my wife, or this is what it's like to live with my husband, or this is what it's like for me to try to live. So they're, they're pretty engaging to read. I think you'll like them. Well, I'm going to stop now.